Hello everybody and thank you for joining in to episode 2 of Unit 2. Today I want to dive a little bit deeper into uh, why biodiversity is so important and we're going to do that by exploring this topic referred to as ecosystem services. We'll figure out what they are and the, when we discuss them it will help us uh, determine uh, a little bit about why we should care about biodiversity and what ecosystems do for us. So, uh, as I mentioned before, biodiversity has benefits, right? Uh, and the benefits that we humans, mostly, but other organisms as well, receive from healthy ecosystems, functioning ecosystems, are what are called ecosystem services. Things like pollination, for example. Um, so, how does that connect to biodiversity? Well, the more biodiversity you have, the healthier your ecosystem is, and the more ecosystem services you can obtain. And sometimes there's even a direct linkage between biodiversity and ecosystem services, uh, as you might piece together in a little bit. So there are main, uh, four main categories of ecosystem services that we'll be exploring. Uh, at the bottom here are supporting surfaces. These are surfaces that are necessary for um, ecosystems to function on a very foundational basis fundamental level. Uh, and then above that uh, are provisioning services, which are products, physical products that we obtain from ecosystems. Regulating services, which are um, uh, processes that are regulated by ecosystems. I'll go through some examples and you'll see what I mean. And lastly are cultural services, which are non-physical benefits that we get from ecosystems. So let's break these down a little bit. Let's start with provisioning services. This is the most tangible and obvious one. These are the physical material benefits we get from ecosystems. Uh, examples include things like water. We get fresh water from aquatic ecosystems. We get food from ecosystems. We get raw materials like wood uh, for timber and for building, fiber for making clothes and baskets, skins from animals for making clothes and, and leather purses and stuff like that. We also get medicinal resources. Um, oh, here's a picture of lumber. We get medicinal resources. Aspirin comes from the bark of a willow tree, right? Uh, and we also get genetic resources. This is um, regular rice, jasmine rice, and this is golden rice. Um, golden rice is a genetically modified organism that, uh, when it grows, it produces higher levels of vitamin A, which is an important nutrient that isn't available to um, many people in developing countries around the world, it can lead to blindness if you don't have enough of it. So the creation of this golden rice uh, is, was really important because it, it provides a source of vitamin A for a lot of people, and the gene that was transcribed into the genome of this rice plant comes from, uh, there are a couple genes, one of them comes from another plant and one of them comes from bacteria. So the, that is an example of a genetic resource that we have obtained and then used for our own services. Regulating services are things that are going to maintain the health of the ecosystem, maintain the quality. Um, these things are kind of uh, invisible, and they kind of keep things up and running, maintenance, so to speak. And they include things like uh, regulating the local climate, regulating air quality, right? Um, so an example is that uh, evaporation, or transpiration, I should say, from trees and from grass is going to introduce more water in the air, water that has been purified by the plants. They're also going to be doing photosynthesis and respiration, which helps um, uh, purify the air. Uh, pollination is another important regulating service I'll talk about in more detail in a little bit. Erosion control is huge. Uh, the roots of plants help hold the soil together and prevent water and wind from eroding away that soil. That's going to be hugely important for ecosystems themselves, but also our own farms and where we build our houses and things like that. Uh, we've talked about how plants store carbon. Uh, we've talked about decomposition of waste, whether it's your dog's poop or dead animals or dead plants. Uh, ecosystems regulate that waste and reintroduce it back into uh, the matter cycling. Um, and they also buffer natural disasters. I'll show you a, a little gif of what I mean by that, but uh, right, intense root structures like I was just talking about will help reduce the impacts of landslides. Um, lots of trees and, and wetlands can help reduce the impacts of flooding and can help buffer storms like hurricanes. Uh, here's an example of how wetlands filter water. So we've got some soil here, we've got some grass, we've got water flowing through. And as water is going to flow through this, it's going to hit the plants. And the plants are going to slow the water down, which that decreases uh, erosion. It's also going to allow the water to infiltrate into the soil, 
right, to uh, recharge groundwater, for example, um, or um, just uh, um, water the soil. The um, various pollutants that are in there, and when I say pollutants, I mean things like nitrogen and phosphorus. Those are important nutrients, right, for plants, but we don't want to be drinking those in our water, right? Um, and the water is moving slow enough that those nutrients can be absorbed by the plants more thoroughly and more fully, which means that there is less of that in the water that we might end up drinking. It's also flowing slow enough that uh, particulates like pieces of soil, rot, rock, silt, dust, etc., that are floating in the water will be able to settle to the ground. So the water that's coming out is a lot clearer, there's a lot less sediment in it, and there's also a lot less chemical uh, pollution uh, in it. And not just things like nitrogen and phosphorus, but also more anthropogenic chemicals as well. So that's how it, uh, wetlands can filter water. Wetlands, like I said, can also protect from storms. Here are some uh, like fake trees along the shoreline, and over here is going a, a little me mechanism that's going to be generating some waves. Watch what happens to the intensity and energy of the waves once it hits these trees, which are supposed to be a mangrove biome. Take a look. You can see the waves are pretty intense, and the second they hit the mangroves, the wave energy dissipates, dissipates almost completely and the shore is experiencing no wave stress at all, which can have huge impacts in buffering from storms, coastal erosion, st uh, storm surges and flooding, you name it. So wetlands are a great example of um, these regulating services. Uh, let's see. Next are supporting services. Sometimes um, it can get a little confusing to distinguish between a supporting and a regulating services, service. Sometimes there's some overlap. Uh, don't lose sleep over that, right? These are man-made categories to define uh, natural phenomena. There are going to be flaws in it. But I like to think of them as the foundational services that help the ecosystems be what they are. Uh, they are the underlying fundamental processes that allow ecosystems to exist. Uh, examples include primary productivity, right? That's how energy gets introduced into an ecosystem. Um, ecosystems create habitat for other ecosystems. They help create soil, which in itself is a habitat. They help cycle nutrients, cycle water, and cycle energy. Right? These are sort of like fundamental processes that without, you pull one of these out and an ecosystem is going to die. It's not going to be able to exist. Um, I'll show you a diagram in a little bit that, um, actually, if I go back to this very initial diagram I showed you, uh, I like it because it puts supporting services at the bottom. Right, because it's supporting the other three. Right? If you pull one of these out, the rest of it isn't going to collapse necessarily. But if you pull out a supporting service, like nutrient cycling, you can bet the whole ecosystem is going to collapse. Okay, speeding back through this. Um, and the last one is cultural services. These are the non-physical, non-material benefits that we get from ecosystems. and includes things like tourism, science, history, education, recreation, spirituality, religion, um, you know, uh, Native Americans in the United States, but also indigenous people all around the world, and also uh, you and me probably find spiritual or uh, deep sort of emotional value in the world around us. Uh, you might have a deep emotional or spiritual connection to an area, um, a sense of home, a sense of place. That's a legitimate ecosystem service, um, something that's hard to quantify, but it, it is a service that is provided to us by nature. Uh, here's that here's that other diagram showing the same thing with some examples. We've got provisioning, regulating, and cultural services. And again, supporting services is down at the bottom because it's going to help provide the support for the ecosystem to exist and all these other services to take place in the, fir uh, uh, in the first place. Uh, so let's go through an example here. Temperate deciduous forest. That's the biome that we live in. Try and see if you can come up with... Um, some examples of each of these ecosystem services, provisioning, regulating, cultural, and supporting, that a temperate deciduous forest might provide to us that we live in the area. Okay, so provisioning services are pretty easy, right? We're going to get food. Uh, it could be nuts. It could be a variety of crops. It could be animals. We're going to get lumber from these forests by cutting down the trees, and we might even get some medicine uh, from things like willow trees, for example, but also a variety of medicinal herbs. Dandelion tea is great for reducing fever and nausea. Regulating services is a little bit broad, right? Trees are going to regulate the climate. They're going to help cool the air around. They're going to provide shade. 
Uh, they're going to re reg regulate the air quality as well by doing photosynthesis and cellular respiration. That's a typo there, sorry. They're going to store carbon. They're going to help moderate extreme weather events. Could be extreme wind. They're going to help block that wind and buffer it. Um, they can filter water through their roots, but also um, um, what if they absorb water and then it transpires out of their leaves, that's going to help filter it as well. And their roots will also help control erosion. Culturally, right, you can pretty much apply any of these. Um, recreation, you might go hiking. Tourism, you might go see a national park like Shenandoah. Um, there might be spiritual benefits. There could be educational benefits as well. Um, I take my students out into forests all the time for learning purposes. Uh, and lastly, supporting. This is probably the most straightforward because we know that forests cycle uh, ver various nutrients as well as water. They help introduce energy into the ecosystem. Um, their roots will help soil form and they provide habitat for a variety of other species from plants to squirrels to humans to bears, moose, deer, you name it. Uh, an another thing I want to distinguish is that ecosystem services were developed in the 70s as a way to get people who didn't like care about Earth to care about Earth for monetary reasons. Because you can quantify ecosystem services with a dollar value, right? We've got total global value per year in terms of trillions of dollars, trillions. And you've got the ecosystem service here on the y-axis. So you can see that things like treating waste, recreation and controlling erosion, providing food are hugely, hugely valuable services. Um, some of these are not as valuable monetary-wise, but uh, some of these, if you look, are uh, supporting services that help to uh, make these other ones possible. Here's a, another graph that shows a um, similar type of thing. We've got biomes in different colors here. Okay, um, Let me orient you. So the biomes are in different colors, and the colors are uh, available here and here. And then in column A, we've got the size of the area in hectares, which is a, um, a metric unit of area. And in column B, we've got the monetary value per hectare per year in the United States in dollars, right? So take a look at this. We've got 33,000 hectares of open ocean. They estimate $491 uh, per hectare per year. So do some multiplication, and you can determine that the uh, value of the open ocean is pretty high. Um, some of these, take a look at the B column, you'll see which ecosystems have the highest ecosystem service in terms of their value uh, for money, right? Salt marshes and mangroves, they're going to buffet the storms, they're going to filter water, they're going to provide habitat for nursing birds and fish, they're going to provide food, they're going to do primary productivity, they're going to store carbon. So that means that they have a very, very high value per unit area. Um, so an example of this is uh, happened in New York a couple years ago, and I think also in the 90s with the Catskill watershed. Uh, for those of you who don't know, New York City's water is unfiltered, uh, and the reason for that is because they rely on the filtration of the watershed, the lakes, the reservoirs, the forests, and the rivers, um, and the natural ecosystems to provide uh, filtering services for New York's population. Unfortunately, uh, a couple years ago, a couple decades maybe, sewage and pesticide pollution made that very difficult for the ecosystem to do. It, it was not able to keep up with filtering the waste and purifying the water. Uh, so what New York did is they invested about a billion dollars into fixing that problem, uh, reducing the dumping, um, preserving and protecting that land, um, keeping all facilities up to date, etc. That's going to increase, or that ended up increasing the absorption of chemicals into the soil, uh, chemical filtering and nutrient cycling, which ultimately led to improved water quality. And like I said, this was a billion dollar project, but the alternative was to construct a water treatment plant, which would have cost about $10 billion plus $100 million of upkeep annually. So this project of, of uh, saved the state of New York a ton of money, right? I, I'm not joking when I say that these ecosystems provide a lot of financial um, benefit. Um, unfortunately, there are things that we do as humans that can disrupt these ecosystem services, whether it's deforestation, whether it's pollution and oil spills, um, and ultimately they will have both economic and environmental consequences, right? Um, oil spills damage the oil industry, they damage the fishing industry in terms of money, but they also damage that ecosystem, right? 
Here's a great example of pollination in California. Uh, about 15 to 30 percent of food production in the United States relies on pollination by bees when they carry the pollen from one flower to another and help those plants reproduce. Plant sex. Many farmers, though, are importing bees from Europe. The European honeybee is, a, is not native to the United States, and that's what you think of when you think of a bee. It's a European honeybee. Because we're importing it from Europe because the agricultural practices of using pesticides and insecticides make it hard for our United States bee populations, the native populations, to get this job done on their own. So they've actually had to start bussing in bees from across the ocean. And it's such a valuable industry, bees are so worthwhile, that they're actually seeing heists where people are stealing bees out of people's uh, farms. And it sounds kind of silly, but I'm talking like, um, there's one farmer, he had like four hives stolen, and he estimated it cost like $45,000 just for those four hives. Um, so bees are a very, very important they play a hugely important role in our agriculture, um, and they're in high demand because of our uh, actions in terms of uh, pesticide use. Another example with the same thing, um, pesticide use in China has uh, led them to the point where not only are they uh, renting bees in the same way that uh, California farmers sometimes do, but they're actually pollinating things by hand. Um, they're taking these little sticks and putting pollen on them, and then they're touching it to the tip of every flower individually. Um, because it's actually, uh, it's relatively cheap, and, um, excuse me, they can't, um, they don't have any native pollinators due to pesticide overuse. Uh, so this is a, a, another example of how anthropogenic actions are impacting ecosystem services. Um, their food production is, is severely slowed because of this. So that's pretty much it for ecosystem services. We'll do some practice in class, um, but I want you to come to class thinking about this question. What other anthropogenic activities might disrupt ecosystem services, and how might that work? I talked about pesticide use and pollination. I gave you these other two here, right, deforestation and on oil spills. But what else might we be doing that is going to disrupt ecosystems and also ultimately the benefits that we obtain from them? All right, that's all I got for you this time. If you have questions, um, bring them to class, and I will see you then.